Hello and welcome to uh, to episode three of series two of uh, of the Pivot Performance. Uh, we haven't started the session yet, but if uh, you'd like to uh, to get comfortable, and while you do, uh, and you find your way around uh, LiveStorm, for those of you not uh, not familiar with it, uh, please do make your way to the chat function and let us know uh, where you're joining us from. Uh, uh, I can say that uh, that uh, I'm. Uh, we've got a, a truly international panel today, and uh, and I'm. Uh, in uh, the south of England. Guy, where are you? I'm in uh, Western North Carolina in the USA. Wonderful. Timu, where are you? I'm in uh, dark Stockholm uh, right now. Wonderful. And Frederick, you'd be in dark Stockholm if you weren't in? Yeah, I I'm actually in, in Spain, in uh, sunny <laughs> San Sebastian at, at the moment. So it's... Um... It's, it's amazing here, I would say. <laughs> Not to rub it in, Timu. Uh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Frederick. So, uh, so let us know where, whereabouts you are. Um, you, will, um, uh, you will see uh, that, uh, that uh, oh, hello, Dale, in, uh, in Washington. Um, you will see that, uh, that uh, a lot of the functionality is probably similar to, uh, to Zoom or Teams, as you may have seen before, uh, there, as well as the, the chat function. Hello, Mary. Um, you will see that, uh, that down at the bottom, there is also a React function by clicking on uh, the, uh, the emojis. Uh, you can encourage us, you can, uh, you can give us uh, um, uh, your immediate reactions. Um, we will be kicking off uh, very, very shortly, but before we do, I'll let you know that we are recording this, uh, this session. So um, you will receive everybody who has, uh, has registered uh, to attend today, whether, whether you're with us or not, uh, will receive a copy of this. So uh, all I'd ask is uh, please be generous and uh, uh, feel free to share the recording with, uh, with any uh, friends or, uh, or colleagues. Uh, so without further ado, um, I, will, uh, I will kick us off. Welcome to episode three in series two of L&D's Pivot to Performance. In this series, Guy Wallace and myself, David James, will be speaking with esteemed guests about their own pivot from learning focused practice towards a performance orientation that more predictably and reliably, let alone efficiently and successfully, achieves demonstrable results for both employees and organisations. For the five conversations we have scheduled in this series, each two weeks apart, we've invited guests that have made the pivot themselves and have achieved real results from doing so. We'll invite our guests to share their stories, we'll question them on their approaches and encourage them to share relatable experiences to inspire you to either initiate or enhance your own pivot. We'll also seek plenty of opportunities for you to get involved too. But perhaps we should start with our introductions, including our own pivot from learning focus to performance focus. And Guy, would you like to kick us off? Thank you, David. Sure. Uh, so I'm Guy Wallace, and I started in the business back in 1979, and I think I'm one of the few lucky ones. I was oriented to performance from day one on. I was taught the methodologies or adapted methodologies of the late Gary Rumler and the late Tom Gilbert, uh, Bob Mager, Joe Harless, to just name four of the gurus, the thought leaders from back in the day, back in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and I think it's really critical as a consultant for the past 40 years, I've seen much training and development, learning, instruction that was not oriented, not focused on the performance aspects. Too often we've focused on behaviors or topics, tasks or competencies. Skills is a big thing now, but they were all absent of a focus on the application of those to people's work, their performance in the workflow, the work streams, the processes. And that's what's really critical. And I'm really excited to hear uh, our guests today talk about uh, their journey into this world. Wonderful. Thanks, Guy. Um, uh, if, I, if I go before, uh, before our uh, guests uh, do their introductions, uh, as I mentioned, I'm David James, and uh, I've been in, uh, in learning development nearly 25 years, and 15 years of those were uh, either in learning and development teams or leading uh, learning and development teams, um, perhaps most notably at Disney, where I was Director of Learning, Talent, and Organizational Development for uh, the EMEA head office. Um, now, um, very differently to, uh, to Guy, I was, uh, my skill set grew from the classroom, and, uh, and I focused very much uh, on being the very best facilitator I could be. 
uh, and then also um, providing uh, the, the most all-encompassing learning provision uh, that I possibly could. But the conversation changed uh, when I was leading uh, the, the learning and development functions at Disney. And all of a sudden, I realized that the, the outcomes that I was being tasked to achieve uh, weren't possible with the solutions that I'd been developing and delivering for, for nigh on the decade before. And so it was a, a real reality check uh, when asked to uh, to be involved in integrated functions, um, uh, business functions, and also um, uh, cross-training uh, salespeople. And so uh, with that, uh, I became very much performance uh, focused. Uh, and then I suppose in the last few years uh, have really um, channeled uh, that focus onto digital uh, as well, because um, uh, along with the the, uh, the priorities that Guy had just mentioned there, and especially with upskilling and reskilling, we're hearing a lot of nonsense right now uh, about how certain approaches to developing and surfacing content uh, is going to close skills gaps. Uh, but in the absence of sorcery and other types of witchcraft, uh, we're not going to be able to. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and so I've joined uh, as a, I, I'd say I'm a, um, I'm a born again uh, performance oriented uh, practitioner. <laughs> but I feel as if I'm rambling on far too much now. We're taking up valuable time uh, from our guests. Uh, and so uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, to welcome uh, our two guests today, uh, Timu and Frederick from Telia. Hello to you both and thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure. Uh, Thanks a lot. So you're very, you're very, very welcome. Um, perhaps you then you could uh, you could kick us off then with uh, with a short introduction to your backgrounds in uh, in learning and development. Uh, who'd like to uh, to go first? I can go first. Uh, so of course so you can. can. <laughs> 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 so my name is Tiamo Lilia. I, I work as a um, um, learning and performance lead or or. Um, learning and performance business partner, basically, for, for um, our sales organization in, in uh, Telia, Telia Sweden. So, uh, so supporting about 1,000, give or take, 1,000 uh, employees internally and, and probably double or, or triple that uh, externally. And, and uh, I have not worked within L&D for 25 years or consultant for 40. I am not a professor of any any kind <laughs> my background is actually within sales and i've uh, probably done um a pretty usual journey you know from being a quite good sales rep to being a quite good uh, sales manager to being a quite good sales trainer and and coach to end up um being responsible for or or basically running learning or training uh, within a sales uh, organization um, so it's not much more complex than, than that, but I think that many people um, can relate to that journey, especially within sales, because that's the, that's the usual journey. Mm. Yeah, uh, wonderful. Um, and Frederick, um, what was, what's uh, your uh, background in learning and development? Uh, I, I would say my, my, my background is pretty similar to, to Timo's actually, um, and uh, I, I, I worked with, within the L&D for about 10 years maybe, mm. um, also started as a sales rep and, and, and um, sales manager and, and then I got into facilitating and, and doing a lot of classroom training back in the days. Um, and now, now I have the privilege of, of uh, uh, being like the global head of learning within Telia since just a couple of months back. Um, haven't even haven't even updated my LinkedIn profile. I, I realize right now, and and, <laughs> and I also um, for like for the last five five and a half year, I've been heading the Swedish learning organization within Telia Company. So um, yeah, that's about it. Wonderful. Um, so so let's let's get to uh, to um, uh, the topic of the uh, the conversation. Then I'd love to know um, if you could share what your own personal pivot to performance was. Um, perhaps what was normal for you before, what was your aha moment, and what did you lead? What what did that lead you towards? Sorry. Yeah, so um, um, normal before was was um, basically being being very training and uh, event focused, just the things that you you debunked there. Uh, <laughs> we did either you know two day classroom trainings of of everything or or e learnings of everything with generally you know, 
low engagement as it always is. Mm. And um, you know, if we if we really wanted to go big, then we probably had some some e learning to be done before attending our two day classroom training. So so that's basically where we come from because that's how we were uh, taught in a way. You know, it, it, these these events or these trainings then were you know very topic centric like um, um, we talked about learning objectives that that uh, was to uh, learn our our products and services and to get to know our you know ways of working in in customer meetings you know role play was probably the best thing we did during these trainings but but everything happened you know in that classroom or or during that training or 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 or, or that uh, that e-learning uh, and these uh, you know th these trainings were also pretty static. Uh, we we didn't really you know change anything uh, over over time. If we did, it was probably to you know adding some some YouTube clips into the existing slides and and which we thought someone would uh, uh, would be uh, that, that people would like, or even worse, that we thought that we would have liked if we still were sales reps right and, and then we measured basically how many people attended and and what they liked about the content and what they liked about the trainer and and stuff like that so yeah yeah we basically come from gathering people in rooms and trying to fill their heads with the information without any kind of you know plan or any kind of strategy to actually transfer that information or that knowledge into into practice or, or actually, you know, applying any of it back on the job. So that, that I would say that that, that was normal uh, before. Mm -hmm. and, and the aha moment uh, was basically the summer of 2019 when we, when we find, found your podcast, David, and, and we talked about it in your podcast that was uh, <laughs> released yesterday. So, so uh, um, just uh, marketing that episode, uh, you, you can hear all about it there. But, but the timing was uh, right because we, we just have, you know, we, we had just started to question um, our role as this uh, strategic uh, business partner, what, what, what that actually meant for us. Well, like uh, we were doing a lot of stuff uh, that, that everyone seemed to like uh, or even love, uh, but, but, but what did we actually bring to the table in a way? What, what impact could we isolate to, to our efforts? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that was nothing really. So, so um, you know, just your conversations with, led us to start talk about our ambitions, basically. We, we started to, uh, you know, evaluate our, our own processes and, and, and most importantly, maybe, evaluate the 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 outputs we produce and, and the and the business outcomes of our own efforts um, so basically long long story short uh, that made us understand that we we had to change um, mm. in our heads we, we didn't really have a choice after after that great and i've got to i've got to ask then because uh it's uh it's a question that anybody even considering this pivot themselves will be asking. So was the motivation more inside you because you what you expected more from yourselves, your and your solutions rather than it coming from outside? And the reason I ask the question is that regardless of the efficacy, uh, you know, the, the, the ability for learning and development people to to produce a desired outcome being so limited the expectations of stakeholders a lot of the time is that whatever happens it will do so it does you, you very rarely get stakeholders asking for a performance oriented approach so so are you saying that the drive came from within or was that was there external pressure it, it came from within uh, there was no external press pressure whatsoever i just had a talk with with a colleague sophia today who's probably listening in uh, and I, I we said that um this probably came from within because our background from sales we are used to you know uh, the time and, and effort we put into our work we are used to being measured on that and and mm -hmm. also being paid for for <laughs> for that and and when we 
you know, started to look at it from that perspective, we saw that, you know, we were measuring the, the wrong things. We, we, we really, we, we were a big team and we saw many teams, uh, L&D teams being, you know, chopped into pieces because when it goes good in a company, then you put money into learning and development. But when we, as now going into this, uh, uh, this uh, different kind of times, uh, it's easy to cut in learning and development units. Yeah. And, and, and uh, we just felt that we had to have something to show when you know some of these big uh, uh, big consultancy companies come with their where with their knife and, and start to mm. cut us then we need to show some hard hard evidence on that uh, we're not the unit you should cut in um so, yeah. so I, I think that that was the internal like um decision that we had to do something yeah take a more like was that like more proactive like proactive perspective on that and and like start working to to with our like um, uh, to measure our uh, impact to 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 so 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 so, so as as you said Timo when 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 the big company like the, the big the big um, uh, consultant companies come and try to tear us into pieces then 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 we need can show that we 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 make an impact and not just mm-hmm. only measuring the input of what we're doing um, before so. Um, so there's real foresight on uh, on on your part. I mean, there's there's that burning feeling inside that you know you should be achieving more, uh, and then there was the foresight and the will to go and do that. There's you know there's the phrase make hay while the sun, while the sun shines. So you know the so the sun was out and no one was asking for anything different. You pivoted and um, showing a a, a, a dim, like an actual difference and making planned impact. And now you're not looking over your shoulder thinking, I wonder if we'll be found out because like everybody we've had on here who've made the pivot, you've done that because you know it's the right thing and you future proofed yourself as a result. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, via, via um, plenty of, uh, of awards um, uh, and, uh, and positive impacts that we, we will come to uh, very shortly. Um, now, since your uh, your pivot, you're likely to have refined your approach to analysis or or discovery, uh, what, uh, whatever you might call that. Because you know, as guys talked about for for many many years, and I'm a huge advocate of as well, is that if you don't understand the performance problem that you're seeking to address, then you you could do anything. Uh, and I think that that's 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 uh, the approach in a lot of learning and development. You know, in the absence of knowing, then that vast content suite might look all right or that generic program might look all right. But could you share with us um, what works for you um, uh, in terms of the analysis? Um, yeah, of course. Um, so. Should I take this one or? Yeah, do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I would try to, try to take like step by step. Mm. Um, so, so then it starts with like um, the stakeholders, like even letting us uh, or maybe the, like wanting us to do an analysis because that's not that's not always the case uh, in the beginning. Um, so the first conversation is very important to get right because usually they already have a picture in their head of what they want to achieve or like what the problem is and they already come with like a solution to it as well like we want a workshop on this and a training on mm-hmm. on this and a like an e-learning on the, or, or on that so so we need to like steer the conversation from from that training request um to chat about performance outcomes and, and understand the business rationale behind the request so for this we use this a simple template called uh, the program performance path uh, and it's from Brinkerhoff's method- methodology um, and there's like like a lot of different resources for for having these kind of conversations but I, I think that one is really really good and it's very, very simple and it's like easy to to understand and use so um, yeah in, in that first conversation we we map up out like all the performance outcomes uh, or the KPIs of those requests uh, and then we dig into where we can see that this is an actual problem and, and how we know if we get any better or make any difference. So we make it a little bit more like data driven and measurable. So, so um, we, we all also want to know like how to prioritize the desired performance outcomes are. So, you know, how it's connected to the business strategy. And this is also important because we know that if it's not important, then 
it doesn't matter what we do because like we can do really really great things but it won't make any difference at all so mm -hmm. then we map out the, the target groups um, uh, or the groups of people we want to influence and and during this like first conversation we start asking some like pretty detailed question about the workflows or like of the, of the, of the target groups um, and that is brilliant because that's like usually when our stakeholders we say that he or she isn't right really sure uh, and that is enough for us from from that we will say like yes mr miss or mr stakeholder we will look into this but we'll need to involve and talk to the people that is actually doing the work before we get started so like getting this accept for like, going forward um, then, then it would be much easier for us to like start with the analysis um, and and uh, after that like we don't have that much of a problem. So at that point, we usually have a, a buy-in from the stakeholder because we are more like performance oriented and they start understanding that we actually want and like maybe even can help them with, uh, yeah, with the problem or what, what they what they come, come with from the beginning. Mm. So next up, I would say it's like understanding the workflow uh, and that can be some one-to-one -one interviews. It can be workshops with the like impact groups and SMEs and, and all, always like depending on the case, I would say. Um, and this is like essentially about finding the moments that matters or the points of need. And uh, we basically end up in like flow charts that shows us uh, like who is doing what and, and when and in what system or platform are they when they are doing this and where do they get stuck? Where do they get like support? Where can they find the resources? Um, so basically like trying to understand the whole end to end process. Uh, and then we can show them like the desired performance outcomes and describe the business rationale behind it and ask what they think makes sense in the context of their work. So how could they do it faster or do it more or with better quality or like whatever the performance outcomes are. And a question is always asked if they wouldn't like, uh, if, they, if, they, if they wouldn't get like any training at all, uh, what would they need uh, uh, and where would they need it to still get through the process? So the interesting part of like these conversation is that um, they of course like never end up in training solutions, uh, but they come up with all kind of different uh, things uh, that is not just just what do you say like focusing on on, on training. Hmm. So yeah, usually it, uh, it's some kind of flaw in the process or like lack of resources or support while doing the work or like incentives uh, and i mean there probably can be a lot of things that training wouldn't solve so mm -hmm. yeah uh, and by involving people in uh, analysis we create ambassadors and, and champions uh, for for the initiatives which which is great like i said later on and we find people very honest talking to us uh, you know they don't tell us what they think we want to hear we we are very clear on that we want to hear like the ugly truth how ugly it may be so um uh, that creates great openness and and, and uh, connection to 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 the stakeholders as well and uh, the next step is um uh, then we need to get like quantitative input uh, so we can run like assessments uh, in the organizations about um, the findings from the more uh, qualitative like analysis uh, and those assessments we have sometimes been like using as a way to measure impact in case we uh, we don't have data like readiness or, or something else. So, um, but then again, so, sometimes we go quantitative before doing qualitative interviews. So that, that's also depends on the case, but um, yeah. And after that, we bring all of the data and insights together with a story uh, to our stakeholders and give them a recommendation that probably would solve their problem. And in big projects that can look like a business case with specified cost for resources so that we need and like predictions on ROIs and stuff like that. But usually it's a couple of slides uh, with what we found during discovery and what we would recommend to try in small scale. And then we design and develop the solution as an MVP and run a pilot and 
measuring the impact against the reference group so we can isolate it. Um, that ends up in a report that we present for the stakeholders and then we give them a new recommendation to either scale or redesign or try again or sometimes just like throw in the trash and, <laughs> and move on <laughs> to the next problem. <laughs> so yeah, so this is like the way we found out about the performance outcomes and like reality checked um, the rationale behind it. Um, mm. So we have involved the, like the target groups in an uh, analysis, whatever, uh, um, yeah, doing an analysis on, on, on the workflow and, and the moments that matters uh, and the barriers. So, so yeah. Uh, yeah, and with that presentation of our recommendations, we will not only feel more like confident in moving on to design, but we will also be taken more seriously in the future, I would say. Uh, and especially if our design turns out to actually solve the problem. But yeah, that is something that we will know after we have run the pilot. And those end reports that we always present after the pilots will always is also like help us in, in marketing because they show that like the real value get out in KPIs that matters to the business. Um, mm. So, um, and, and for those attending to the programs or whatever it is. So, so um, yeah, with time, like, uh, yeah, I, th I think if that, that, that's, that's about the process, I would say. That, that's basically, basically it. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. There's, there's so much I, I love about that. You, there, when you were talking about the uh, you know, training there, asking that question that, uh, that you, you, know, you, you you know about what what they would expect to get out of that training what i loved about it is that you stood where they are you didn't try to change their mind there um you um you didn't try to to sell them a different approach you 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 explored with them what they hoped to achieve from what they asked for and i think that is true leadership um when when you lead people from where they are uh, what I think is uh, is often the case uh, or, or counter to that is almost renegade leadership, which is running into the future, creating a different type of nirvana and trying to wave to get people to come and join you. But we really you look like a crazy man um, and, uh, and people <laughs> people don't don't trust that the next that the, 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 the next step they make. Uh, is going to be worthwhile, but but it sounds both uh, you know hugely pragmatic as as well as uh, hugely effective. Um, there's so much in there, and uh, and in uh, and in a moment we'll explore that in a, in a real life example. But I wonder, guy, do we have any questions uh, at this stage? Yes, we do. We have a, a two part question, if you will. But I think the first one was just answered, and that was, what is it that you're doing concretely now? that bring the pivot to performance into life. And I think you've shared that with us by asking the questions of the stakeholders up front and et cetera. But I think this next one here, you can, you can answer now. What have you noticed and heard in the organization differently since you've made that pivot? I, I've, and I had written down the question here, what are you sharing with your stakeholders and how are they reacting to that? So what's different about your relationship with your stakeholders? Yes, I can. I can try answer that because we've we've made these uh, these end reports uh, uh, many times uh, to our stakeholders and to the impacted groups. And I think that j just just to give the 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 you know the background to the the um, the reaction to to this pivot is that on a high level, it, it's about you know um, falling in love it, it, with the problem, and that sounds very cheeky, but but that's the truth. You know, it, you know it. It, it all comes down um, to basically understanding um, the problem, and you cannot do that without involving uh, those those um, uh, you know the target groups uh, that that uh, that that you are trying to influence. Because you know understanding the problem is the same as understanding the workflow for me nowadays. And understanding you know in that workflow, you you need to map out the the tasks that is being done in that workflow and understanding the, the the underlying processes of those tasks and then also understanding from the target group what barriers they have uh, to actually perform on those tasks because you know be, before we we know all of these things we we really we 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 were only guessing back back in the days you know how, how could we uh, solve a problem for for someone 
if we don't know the people we are trying to 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 impact and we know, don't know the problem itself right so so i think that that's a good background to what what the stakeholders and and <clears throat> most of all the impacted groups <clears throat> tells us after this uh, these uh, different initiatives and activities that we design and run nowadays is that um we hear line managers who who has never been it basically never been involved in some of our, uh, our activities because there's been this uh, mismatch in expectations when when line managers send their people out to sales training and they come back they expect that they are trained so that's it now we can go do what you've been trained on and the trainers back in the days were getting these people into these classrooms and giving them the knowledge they need uh, and when they close the door to that classroom our trainers is expecting line management to take that and do something with it in the workflow. But but that, you know, um, that's why the, the mismatch, mismatch on expectations. So the big difference in our pivot to performance is that we, in, we in, involve the, the, the target groups. And, and most of all, we, we involve uh, managers in those processes. Uh, so... What we hear after you know running activities or, or running these uh, initiatives is that people come to us and say that um, basically thank us uh, because we help them to do their work better. Uh, and same thing with sales reps. Uh, you know, if we take responsibility to actually um, apply the new knowledge back on the job, and they will see uh, the 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 impact on the KPIs they are measured on, it's the same thing. We help people to do their job better. And because of that, our end reports shows when we when we have done analysis, right? And, and we have this uh, hypothesis, which we are trying out, and they, 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 um, they were right, so we are impacting the right KPIs. That end report, which we show to different, you know, leadership teams, like this was the problem we're, we were trying to solve. Uh, the, this what was uh, analysis said. This was our hypothesis. This was what we tried out. This was the reference group. And this was the result. So um, uh, how could they not? You, you know, I always say it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's easier to convince to this pivot to performance than learning and development is. Um, every time. It, 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 it's the it's the same thing. I don't know if I even answered the question because I yeah, get angry when I talk about <laughs> these things. <laughs> we have we have got a lot, a lot of more like credibility in the organization, I would say as well. And and people co don't come to us with 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 like an, an learning request anymore. They come to us with a with a um, like a problem uh, instead, which is yeah. which is like way much better and and way much way much fun as well. I would say for for us to work with. Um, so, so we we not not just only we have like worked with our our like mindset shift from from here to there. We we, we also have created a more fun, engaging environment for for ourselves working with learning. I would say. Yeah, um, and, and and just to add to that, that of course, uh, I, I always say that too. That th this this journey is about taking two steps forward and one step back, and and trying to get to to forward again, uh, because. Of course, they some sometimes they come with this uh, training requests or this event requests or, or something like that. Uh, but it, it's nowadays more often than not that they come to us with uh, not just a problem because that that's sometimes the case, but more of like uh, we we would need to um, look at this process. What what is not working? Or or here is this new task coming up because of this new feature or product or service that is, that is coming up. So can you look at this this uh, 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 this specific task? Uh, and those projects uh, is so much more, um, uh, what do you say, impactful to work with because they are always measurable and they, 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 they always impact uh, the business in a way like, you know, the business in, 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 uh, what they prioritize. So, mm -hmm. so that's the consequence of it. And I think that, as I said, I talked to my colleague uh, today and she was like, um, uh, I haven't really understood, um, 
the journey we've done uh, before, you know, lately, uh, because it, it's it's not something that happens, bam, and and it's done. It, it has happened so so iterative, so so people probably don't even notice it if, if, if you don't talk with me today and one year from now. That's when you see the big difference. But until then, it's just small steps forward all the time. Um, yeah. But you, but you guys have been awarded uh, as well for it, both externally um, from your organization and from within. Could you just explain uh, what that recognition um, has been? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, so we we, uh, we won two uh, major awards. We're so damn proud of these uh, awards because that they are receipts on, on that we are doing something right. Uh, and and it, it hasn't always been easy. So one of the awards was uh, my stakeholders nominating me for the reinventor of the year award at Telia, which is, you know, it's probably the biggest thing you, you can you, you can win in in uh, as a Telia employee. But the winning wasn't the big thing. Uh, it, it was the actual nomination that got me like ah crying like a baby because <laughs> uh, you know we, we've been like this with with, uh, with my stakeholders like. Uh, um, they are used to work in, in a certain way. They have this, you know, expectations of the learning team, and and sales training has always looked like sales training. Uh, so for about three years, uh, you know, I've been pushing this agenda and 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 not giving back or or you know not not uh, letting go from these principles. And and three years later that nomination came to me. I said, I don't care if I win. I already won, you know, so so th this is great. So so now we are best buddies, me and my stakeholders. That, that <laughs> I, the world's best stakeholders nowadays. Uh, everyone should have them. Uh, and the other uh, thing we won was, it was, um, uh, it's the Swedish Learning Association, which uh, they have this, uh, you know, annual um, uh, Swedish Learning Awards. So, so all the Swedish big companies comes in with the, uh, with the, their own nominations like this is what we've done this year and there's a big jury who uh, looks at all of these different uh, um you know uh, bullets like what have we done what are we measuring what ways of working do we have what methodologies do we use what technology do we have so a bunch of different perspectives on it and that jury uh, gave gave us the the uh, award of of uh, sweden's uh, the learning team of the year is is the uh, correct uh, um term on it so these both things came the, I, I think they came the same night didn't they frederick uh, uh yeah yeah this. yeah i guess i guess we 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 weren't awarded the the, the swedish learn, learn learning awards um the swedish learning team of the year the same night but but we we we, we got to know it the same night as you yeah, yeah. Know that you were you were the um employee of the year uh so so yeah. um yeah, and you and you have been like a big influence in our team. So that's I think those two go like hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, so so, yeah, really yeah, really, really 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 fun and engaging for everyone in the team. I would say. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah incredible uh, validation for uh, for for your pivot, but um, but but remembering that you've pivoted to get better outcomes. You know, this isn't you know this isn't any a superficial. Um, uh, um, uh, transformation uh, for learning and development to do to go from doing it one way to another. This is about achieving real results. Um, now, your your approach, um, uh, whilst whilst incredibly robust, um, could be uh, really useful if you could bring it to life for us. So, I wonder if um, uh, you could share an example of how a problem was presented, uh, perhaps the analysis that you undertook to understand and diagnose, and then what you did to address it. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah, of course. I, I can give you a perfect example of this, which I, uh, because, um, you know, it, one of the first things uh, we did right was um, when uh, uh, Telia acquired a big media company, um, Bonnie Broadcasting, uh, for, for a couple of years ago. Uh, and that meant that um, the sales targets for, uh, you know, uh, sport content these sport packages uh, for retail it basically doubled from one week to another uh, and i had this chat with uh, with uh, the sales director uh, and he gave me the first ever mission to to you know actually 
uh, actually increase sales on a KPI that was super, super important to him. So, you know, we went all in uh, on everything we, we just talked about. We went all in on understanding, you know, the, the, the workflow and, and, and all in on solving that problem and and we did and uh, you know it was nothing like we've we've done before so because we, we had been you know selling these sport content uh, packages before and it, it has always been uh challenging to to hit those targets um and we had we had always had this you know uh, trainings uh, about the product and, and trying to get this one more question into the customer meetings uh, as we always did everything had to fit into the the, the customer meeting and and we we trained people um uh, on that and when 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 that didn't happen then we blamed line managers uh, as we always did uh, because <laughs> because that <laughs> that was that was always our our problem uh, but this was basically this was 600 sales reps uh, that had to double their sales um and and you know what we have done before um obviously wasn't really enough so what we did we we started to talk with people we, we started this analysis and it wasn't that structured back then but but it, it, you know it, it was really clear so we, we talked with top performers uh, that sold these these um, uh, premium packages and we talked uh, talk to low performers and, and, you know, middle performers within retail, within the channel we, we were trying to influence. But we also talked to uh, the telemarketing unit and the field marketing unit who had this as the reason to talk to customers. They only sold this, this product. So there, there must be something in what they do that we can apply within, within retail. And also we talked with our external partners who were, were some of them were, were very successful in, in, in selling this uh, uh, things and, and we basically only um, were, were were asking and talking about the the workflow. So it, it was this you know flowcharts coming up. Okay, what happens then? And if that happens, what happens then? And and where do you get stuck and and, and stuff like that? And we, we needed to understand it from from different perspectives. So what we saw uh, in that analysis because it was only qualitative analysis it, it was only interviews basically so the the, the first we, thing we saw was that we had we had overestimated how interested our sales reps were in sports uh, because for some people you know nhl and nba it was just two different combinations of of, of letters so even if we would have got that that extra question into the dialogue with customers they didn't understand the answer from the customer. They, they, they didn't, they, they couldn't answer any follow-up questions from the customer because the customer knew more than them and they were more interested in sports than, than the sales reps were. So that's why the sales reps never basically asked uh, about this, this uh, sport content. And then they, of course, uh, because of that, that lack of interest, they didn't know the difference between different leagues. Like if we take Champions League and Premier League, uh, they, they didn't know the difference and they didn't know which, you know, streaming services had which rights uh, at, at the time because that changes, you know, over time. And they didn't know um, what our competitors had to offer, uh, you know, at the moment. So uh, they basically didn't understand how great this offer was, uh, this TLA offer, because it was great. And we saw that in, in other channels. Now you're selling as well. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but but uh, uh, but 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 um, uh, we 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 saw that in other units, especially within the the external retail, uh, that you know, uh, knowing your competitors, that that was uh, uh, that that was a big success factor, and, and this also this, this lack of interest it basically made them forget all of these different unique selling points that we tried to you know hammer in them uh, in the past so we had to think you know when do we w when can we nudge them uh, you know with, with the with the right information uh, in the right time uh, where they are when they are having this uh, this dialogue with customers and, and that was not in the lms <laughs> hmm. we were like shit what are we doing now but but uh, we, we we found out some some 
really great, you know, practical stuff too. Like uh, uh, the store safe, the the back office safe. Uh, it had a you know a time lock. So so uh, when 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 sales reps were pushing in the code, they had to wait a couple of minutes until until it uh, opens for for some reason, rubber reason or, or whatever it is. So this was time where where people just stood there and and did nothing but but wait. And another thing that we saw was that all customers coming into the store, they took this, uh, um, what do you call it, a queue paper. Uh, and, and when it was their turn, they came to the desk and they were looking around for a, a trash can where to throw this paper. We never had trash cans in mm -hmm. our stores for, for some reason. Uh, so so um, the conclusion uh, was, was that, you know, we, we had to help these people to start this dialogue uh, and make the dialogue natural and, and easy uh, even though they had this lack of interest among other barriers, of course, uh, too. So, so we knew that we had to, to get impact on scale. We had to design this into the workflow where it's the most natural. And I, I think that the, the, the user story, now I don't remember it uh, maybe exactly as it stands, but, but the user story was brilliant because um, a customer comes in uh, to the store, takes this... Q paper, and, and when they are waiting, they see all of these uh, different uh, uh, screens with with sport content. And when it is their turn, they go to the desk and they see this voting box trash can that we've designed. So the customers get to vote if they look at football or uh, hockey or golf or or something else. And the customer chooses football as an example. Uh, and that gave the sales rep uh, a reason to ask more. Right. So so so. The sales reps were told to uh, or, or trained to uh, just ask which league uh, the, the customer uh, is following. And the customer answers then um, um, Premier League, as an example. So now we knew that that many sales reps didn't know what that was. So so we designed a physical paper as, as a performance support that uh, they, they showed to the customer and, and that uh, that showed with which leagues uh, could be streamed from from which channels, and also what our our uh, competitors had to um, uh, had to offer for for those channels. So the sales rep, you know, finds Premier League in that performance report uh, and, and asks the customer if they are uh, paying for you know the, uh, the the standalone service for it. Because in most almost every case, when when you are following a league, you are paying for the standalone service for it. And flipping that same paper, that performance support. Uh, there was our offering, which was, you know, a lot better than than our competitors after this acquisition. And the sales reps were, were t was told to just close the deal, uh, and they did. Uh, and if if this, you know, this user story uh, for some reason didn't happen, then we had this plan B. Uh, that, that was that we printed out this this um, big poster with unique selling points and and you know frequently asked uh, uh, questions, uh, and that poster. Uh, we put on the back office safe. So when people are there waiting uh, for it to open, uh, they get some bullets that they can go out and pitch to the customers when when going back to the to the floor. So so basically, this voting box uh, and the performance support paper and the and the poster, uh, th this activity as a whole, with almost zero training. I, I think we we had you know 15 minutes of training. For the store leaders, not even the sales reps, for store leaders to to uh, make this activity happen, uh, um, almost uh, almost it doubled, almost tripled the sales uh, in, in our MVP. Uh, and the wow. point here is that um, uh, you know it, it, the sales reps didn't they didn't know more about the products or the services or the packages they were selling, and they they weren't more interested in in sports after this activity but they had this process to follow uh, that was perfectly designed into the workflow because of the analysis we've made when we mapped out all of these different workflows and and, and involved people in, in in creating that so we did a retro and and uh, uh, we tweaked some bits and we we uh, we did some integrations so today the store leaders can can basically 
click on a button to to get the latest stuff to the store and, and get the digital performance support they need to you know initiate this this activity locally and implement it um, themselves without us even you know we're not even involved anymore and and that was something that uh, never had happened before um so that that's one example uh, and it could th this could easily have been like uh, uh, it could have started with uh, like uh, the, the the sales director coming to me and say, saying that hi Tim we need some training on premium sports services next week and I'm like sir yes sir bring everyone we will do a four hour session about it mm -hmm. uh, but but this time it, that didn't happen uh, and because of the impact of that specific activity we had you know more and more and more conversations about this you know this important KPI so if you did this to say to premium services what can you do about these combos or or what can you do with this process and 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 so on um so so that's I think that's a perfect example of when we did analysis right and and we designed to the workflow and we got real impact and that MVP uh, you know, I think it was I think it was 180 percent or 160 percent increased sales on that KPI. Um, that was just crazy. Um, uh, that's amazing. I, you know, uh, for for anybody listening um, uh, and thinking, well, if the solutions were were so um, uh, were so were so small, and you know, it, you know, compared to say your four hour program or uh, or, or creating an app or creating e-learning, um, you know, and that and then that being a reflection on the problem you are solving. All I would say is, the, you know, what you said there several times at the end, Tiamu, it is the power of analysis. A guy, you, I mean, you, you're one person who doesn't need convincing of this and you, you have so much more insight to say. To, the more useful analysis you do up front, the less work there is at the other end rather than the other way around. When you do very little analysis at the beginning, you spend all your time in design or procurement and delivery via scheduling. And then you wonder at the end, what was the ROI? If you flip that around, yeah. do your analysis as you've described there, uh, you know, the, the, the task analysis, um, what that looks like in the workflow. And you do that robustly. In the end, your solutions are laser focused. They're much smaller. And then. You know the, the returns that you've just described there uh, for a sales team are uh, you know for for every salesperson is absolutely incredible and if anybody's listening to this are wondering whether they should be uh beginning their own pivots performance i think that 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 right there is uh is, is every reason to guy i mean you're, any any comments yes and i think uh, i made some notes here you know we're talking about a pivot to performance but in the old days we might have said pivot to the process or pivot to the work stream or pivot to the workflow. Those are all equivalent. If we don't understand the performance, the workflow performance of the individuals we're trying to target, then we're only guessing. And so you got to look at the task, got to look at the behavioral task, you have to look at the cognitive tasks. What are people thinking before and during and after they perform the overt things that we can observe? We need to understand all of that. And you're, when you went after the, the barriers and where people get stuck, uh, flow charting it, I think that that is exactly what people need to do when they begin to make this pivot. So I had a question here is when you're doing this workflow analysis, are you using flip chart uh, easels and paper or you have some uh, tool that you're using? Uh, are you doing this with individuals? Are you doing with this groups? What can you share with us about that? That that uh, who we are doing it with, um, I, I think, as Frederick says, that we, we start asking these workflow questions already in the conversations with the with stakeholders. the stakeholders. But the the fantastic thing with these senior managers is that they don't know the workflow, <laughs> so so they will so they will they will say that. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure. Okay, then we will look into it. But they know that's a damn good question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then they start to point out these people like you should involve these guys because they do it great and these guys do it great. And then we talk with these guys. And sometimes that is one to ones and sometimes that is as a, a workshop. But and we don't I don't because we don't really have, um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, some some tech to it. it it's more like uh, 
more like an interview. And then we just, you know, you should see my notebook. It's like, I'm just, you map me out and, and then we go through it once again and once again, and then maybe they show me how they do it. And, and you know, um, so it's it's a bad answer because it's different uh, from case to yeah. case. No, uh, that's a great answer because people don't have to rely. It's all about the technology. Mm. It's not. It's about the data that you are eliciting from people who know. Yeah. 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 Yeah, wonderful. And one, and one thing, so sorry, and one, one thing that I really like, like to highlight about this case, as, as you said in the end, Timo, is that like we try to like um, design uh, those like programs or, or these like performance programs, as we call them, without uh, us being involved in the future. So yeah. people can just click and start their own performance program with us being involved at all, like, or maybe 50 minutes, as you said in the beginning, but like, just to make and that's will not make us jobless like the opposite we will, we will have more and more people coming to us and and like ordering other stuff and and, and uh, we're gonna have great conversation with with, with them as well but yeah. um but but just just to make make sure that we make a, as lean process as, as possible without having ourselves in in being involved all the time uh, when yeah. it comes to to like the general uh, learning stuff so that's right. You, 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 rather than make yourself redundant, you'll have more opportunity to make greater impact. And that is what we see again and again and again uh, in these conversations. Now, we have got to wrap up. So we've only got about one minute. Uh, and so, so here's the challenge, guys. What <laughs> advice would you give to, to somebody listening here thinking, I want to make that impact? Um, I want to make this pivot to performance. What, what, what suggestion would you, uh, would you make? This, this, for me, this is easy. This is easy question because first, I, I would say three things from, from the top of my head. First thing would be to actually make this pivot happen because it, it will be worth it. But it will be you uh, guys who will need to do it because no one will ask you to. At least no one asked us. We, we've made that choice ourselves. And the second thing would be uh, these conversations that, that we've talked about. This is... Uh, this is hard because of these expectations on us that you come to us and order a training and we will deliver that training before before deadline so so we, in these conversations we need to steer this the, the 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 chat to you know performance outcomes and we need to make sure that it prioritizes so that it's not just you know some activity someone need to show uh, up in the line that we are doing something there so let's put these guys on it but it has to be something prioritized because otherwise we, we can do whatever we want to do and it will not have any impact. And then uh, the last thing would be to put your efforts um, in analysis. Uh, that, that is what will make you design the right things for the right people at the right time. Uh, and that is what will make everything we do measurable. And and and, and that, uh, that will take us away from this... Uh, training box because if we get these three things right and um, that is what will make us have impact on kpis that actually matters and and and, and you know that itself uh, will uh, change the future conversations we have with the, with stakeholders so that's a positive loop uh, I, I call it a snowball effect in sweden we have much snow <laughs> i don't know from a leadership perspective frederick do you want to yeah, but, uh, maybe out of a leadership perspective perspective i would say it's about like consistency we we we, we made up a plan we, we we made our like we we our mindset shifts um that we were stuck with for for the last couple of years and like in every team meeting we hammered them in 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 every like conversation we have with, with an important stakeholder we talk about our mindset shifts and and yeah it's it's about consistency and like stick to the plan and and uh and, and give give the the employees like the right tools and and and, and engage them to to really work with those kind of um, mindset shift that, that you can you can hear also more about our our mindset shift in, in the in the podcast that we were released yesterday <laughs> more, more commercial here but yeah but 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 um, um, and, and and encourage when, when people like make progress and and like when, when we're designing for for tasks and not not topics and when we when we work more more uh, data driven instead of with gut feeling and, and so on and and follow up on that in in, in one-to-ones with with your staff as well with have been really 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 important i would say 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Timu, uh, Frederick. This has been so inspiring uh, as well as insightful. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, thank you uh, very much for, for attending as well. Um, we will uh, very shortly after this recording uh, uh, ends, you will receive uh, an email with a copy of the recording within it. Uh, and so, uh, again, do your friends and family, uh, colleagues and peers a favour uh, and send them uh, a copy of this. Um, because I'm sure that uh, that they will uh, they'll feel um, suitably inspired as well. Um, we've got two more uh, of these conversations to go um, in two weeks' time. Two weeks today, we're going to be speaking with Judy Hale, and two weeks after that, we're going to invite our guests back for a panel discussion and field your questions uh, that uh, that that you we will uh, ask you to send in advance uh, to help with your pivot. Uh, and so we hope that you'll in, uh, you'll join us then. Um, but all that's left to say is, uh, is thank you again, Tiamu. Thank you very much, Frederick. Guy, I'll see you in two weeks as well. And yes. uh, <laughs> take care till then. Uh, and we'll see you then. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.